In this unit, we're going to talk about some theories of cognitive development that are very popular in education, as well as a few that are lesser known. These ideas are covered in the article by Nora Newcomb. If you haven't already, please be sure to read the article first and then come back and watch this video. You may also want to have the article handy while watching the video so you can refer back to the descriptions given in the article. As we get started, I would like you to think about the question, why does it matter that we understand theories of cognitive development as we become educators? Nativism is the theory developed by Immanuel Kant. He believed that infants are born with some innate knowledge. He also believed that some categories are understood at birth. For example, infants are able to categorize the sound of their parents' voices as safe and connected compared to the voices of strangers. Empiricism is the theory developed by John Locke. It is considerably different than nativism in that he believed in the idea of tabula rasa, meaning that infants are blank slates at birth and only know what they are taught by those around them and the experiences that they have. Constructivism might be the most widely known theory of development. This one was developed by Jean Piaget. He characterized the development of all children as going through four discrete stages as they construct knowledge. As you can see here, Piaget's stages were bounded by chronological years. He believed that all children went through these stages in this order. Piaget described learning, or schema development, through two processes. The first of these is assimilation, in which children understand their environment in terms of existing cognitive structures, or things they already know. The other process is accommodation, which involves changing cognitive structures to make sense of new observations of the environment. To understand assimilation and accommodation, let's think about a toddler or young child who has limited understanding of pets and who has only seen cats at this point in their short life. So the child who has cats has developed some exemplars or features that help place cats into the category. For example, cats are small and have soft fur and cats have ears that stick up with long tails. Now, when the small child encounters a dog, first the child is going to try and use the process of assimilation to figure out what the dog is. They will try to categorize the new information based on the features that have been established for the category of cat. Small, soft, soft, soft fur, pointy ears. So the child might think that the dog is a cat based on the similarity of features. However, when the child is told that this is actually a dog, accommodation takes place. The child has to adjust their cognitive structures to add the new category of dog. In other words, the child was not able to add the new sample to their existing structure of what a cat is, so they had to create a new piece of information, a new connection in their schema to accommodate dog. Piaget used some of the characteristics that newborn children exhibit to support his theory that they do in fact have some knowledge at birth and that they develop schema through the processes of assimilation and accommodation. Newborns will shift their eye gaze towards sound or movement, even though their vision is not that good. They will also react differently when they hear their parents, especially mom. Similarly, infants will habituate to the sound or movement, meaning that once it has occurred enough times, it's no longer interesting, so they stop paying attention. Infants also reach for and grasp items within their reach in an effort to figure out what the thing is and to add that information to their schema. While Piaget's theory is very popular, it's not without its flaws. The first of these issues is related to the stages that Piaget developed. In the development of stages, Piaget determined that all kids go through the stages the same way at the same time in their life. Think about your experience with children's development, whether it's your own, a sibling, kids that you've worked with, or babysat. Are all the children you've encountered the same at every age? Another issue with Piaget's stages is that while he did believe that infants had some abilities, he greatly underestimated their cognitive competence. Finally, and probably the biggest flaw, is that Piaget did research with his own children. This means that it's really hard to determine if other kids would be the same as his. We'll discuss later in the semester the impact that genetics and environment play in human development. Lev Vygotsky is another constructivist, but he had a different view on development than Piaget. He believed that we largely learn through the cultural transmission of tools. 
In other words, Vygotsky believed that adult models we encounter have a great deal to do with how we learn. For example, we typically learn to speak from the adults in our world who model the development of words. The adults around us also explicitly teach us about new things. Vygotsky did not believe that all children develop the same, and to support his theory, he analyzed different cultures to see how different children developed. Vygotsky's theory relied much more heavily on interaction with adults and collaboration with peers in our environment. One of the best known parts of Vygotsky's theory is the zone of proximal development. This is the range of tasks that a child can perform with the help and guidance of others, but cannot yet perform independently. According to Vygotsky's theory, as we learn, we have things that we can do all by ourselves, things that we can do with a little bit of help or support or instruction, and things that we simply cannot do even with support. This idea is still used in instruction today. Typically, when we teach children, we want to stay in the middle zone. We want to challenge our students, but we want to make sure that they have enough support to be successful. This is considered the optimal area of learning. Piaget and Vygotsky had some similarities and some differences in how they believed children developed in their constructionist viewpoints. For example, both believe that children are active participants in their learning. They believed that children construct knowledge based on what happens in their environment. Also, they both believed that social institutions and interaction with the world set the conditions for developmental change. Piaget and Vygotsky also had some differences in their theories. First, Piaget thought that peer interaction was far more important than adult interaction for students to develop. Vygotsky, on the other hand, thought that the adult expert who provides guidance, language, and instruction to children was more important. Vygotsky also did not believe that children developed in concrete stages as Piaget did. Vygotsky believed the cultural influence played a significant part in the developmental path of children. Theories of how children develop need to account for the differences that we see in children's development. This leaves us with a few questions. For example, why do some children learn faster than others? We also see that age and level of development are not always aligned. An example of this is how some children will enter kindergarten and can already read basic words and write the alphabet, while others struggle to do these tasks by the end of kindergarten. Some of these questions brought about what is known as the cognitive revolution, where some of the existing theories have been modified and redefined. Another theorist, Noam Chomsky, began investigating development, focusing on the idea of language acquisition. Recall what we learned about Victor, who didn't learn language until later in life, and was limited in the language he was able to develop. Chomsky believed that all infants have a language acquisition device, meaning that some part of the brain was specifically designed to develop language. Chomsky investigated the idea of whether or not we are active constructors of language or if we just require environmental input. Environmental input means that someone is speaking to us and we learn the words. Chomsky supported his position of an acquisition device with an idea that he called poverty of the stimulus. He was referring to the idea that children will learn correct language in spite of the fact that they may not have been exposed to it. In other words, children can learn to speak well even if their parents don't. Another more modern theory of development is called information processing theory, and it stresses environment in development. Information processing theory compares the human brain to a computer that's constantly processing new information that it receives from the environment. Information processing theory supports its position based on the idea that working memory and processing capacity increase as we grow. Further, information processing theory looks at executive functioning. This is referring to attentional control as a similarity to how a motherboard controls a computer. Information processing theory also holds that the development of expertise in one area does not transfer as expertise in another. We will discuss more about becoming an expert later in the semester. Modern nativism is described by two different approaches. The first of these is massive modularity, which suggests that the brain has specific areas or modules that are responsible for different processes. One example of this is the fusiform face area that is said to be responsible only for processing faces. Cognitive neuropsychology investigates this idea based on brain damage that results in loss of a specific area of the brain. In other words, when somebody has brain damage, researchers compare what capabilities they've lost, what they can still do, and the part of the brain that has been lost. This way, they get an idea of what part of the brain was responsible for whatever action got lost. 
The core knowledge theory is similar in that it breaks knowledge down into specific areas. However, this theory suggests that all knowledge falls into four specific domains, which are objects, agents, numerosity, and geometry. Recent research suggests that perhaps social interaction is a separate domain of knowledge. In other words, this theory posits that everything we learn can be categorized in one of these domains. Connectionism has been developed based on early theories of empiricism. It suggests that we build cognitive models based on assumptions that we make about input from our environment and the feedback that we get. It's been compared to the computer model of parallel distributed processing, which is based on a set of rules and exceptions to the rules that must be memorized. We can think about this idea in the context of the English language. For example, when learning to spell, we were taught the rule I before E except after C. Then we had to memorize all the words that didn't follow that rule. I don't know about you, but I still have to slow down every time I try to spell the word weird. Dynamic systems theory is also a descendant of early empiricism. However, it's quite different in that it suggests that there aren't specific rules that can be quantified. Rather, we all learn differently based on a complex variety of contextual variables, which are different for individuals based on their environment and experiences. The modern constructivism theories are variation and selection and neo-constructivism. Variation and selection suggests that individuals choose from a variety of possible strategies when solving problems, and that the strategies they choose are based on the success or failure from previous use. As you can see in the diagram, variation and selection uses an overlapping wave structure to estimate how strategy use changes over time. Neoconstructivism is the second derivative of constructivism. This theory suggests that children are born with some innate knowledge and have structures in place to help them process input from their environment. A key difference in neoconstructivism is the idea that the development of children may be based on their expectancies about objects rather than modules dedicated to specific types of processing. Take a moment to think about your experience as a child and any experiences that you've had with young children. Now that you've been introduced to some theories about how cognition develops, you may have a better understanding of why children behave and think the way they do. One thing to keep in mind is that these are all theories and decades of research has been done to aid in their development. As we continue through the semester, we will be using some of these theories and ideas when we talk about the best ways to teach, strategies for learning, and how to support all students.